I, lo I presented uh, this uh, talk at uh, London uh, and at uh, KubeCon uh, North, uh, Europe in Valencia earlier this year. This time I will do it a bit different, but I, I have brought a buddy with me who's going to talk about the, the, some of the pieces they did at uh, Isovalent. So uh, I will first start with a problem statement, because when you do this and people ask me why we want to do this, there's, there needs to be a problem statement. Uh, the logic is around how do we make our network more tuned to the application? We normally do things with encapsulation, we do uh, some kind of uh, networking tricks, but we don't look at what we're trying to do is actually connect applications. So I, did, I brought just three statements which I liked around how do we, uh, some of the problems around the applications. For example, ne uh, Network 2030 from the ITUT explained that one of the gaps we had in the existing internet right now was the network doesn't really connect well, really well with the, the applications. Another one which is famous, I think, uh, from it was in Medium, somebody complained about how to make the network get out of the way for an application developer. But the one I really liked, it came out of SIGCOM last year with, from Amit from Vadat from Google when he was the, talking about the network uh, and application integration, explaining that most of the time application developers don't really care, should not care, and don't want to learn about the network. They just really want to build their applications. And the concept of what is network for them is kind of overly complex for no reason. And I really like this talk. Because in a utopian world, we would like this to be happening. We would like to be able to have a simple, declarative, and developer-friendly way to do the application networking. Uh, and evolving towards a network specification or a way to expose those networking uh, concepts in a meaningful manner from the, the, for the developers, not really how to do a layer two constructs or layer three constructs. Uh, so basically what we want is a devel an application developer or coder to be able to expect the specifications. Some magic will happen in the network and try and make that happen. And how do we make that developer friendly? So crash course into SRV6 network programming. Some people might have their ears, ears bleeding afterwards, but uh, this, is, this comes out directly from the ITF. It is a, a standard, it's an RFC, which is a 8986, which allows to create network programs using uh, or basically policies composed of instructions and behaviors, or behaviors that we call them. Network programs have a view which are network-wide. You build a network program which is end-to-end -end from a uh, telecom perspective, but uh, your instructions are locally defined. You build uh, your code, and this is the one that ex ex does the, the instructions. It's built based on standard IPv6. It leverages IPv6 as a common denominator and transport. And basically what you do is you connect those small instructions together to create that end-to-end -end program. It uses a source routing paradigm, meaning that at the source of the network or the source of the, the, the domain of segment routing, you actually encode all the, the places you want to up in your network and it will give you the application, uh, the, the, the actual program you wanted to, uh, to adhere to. This is done through either an extension header, which is also a standard, a RFC 8754, or uh, through, um, uh, through basic use of IPv6 other IP headers. It, those instructions are uh, identified or encoded into what we call PAD segments, or segment, uh, segment IDs, which are represented into an IPv6 format. And there's two ways of doing so. One which is the base, which was the initial one, which is uh, using 128 bit of the IPv6 address, to be able to identify segments. The, the, the newer one, which is compressed SID, is how to use some uh, chunks of 16 bits out of that 128 bit to create those segments. Uh, the, the, the latter part being more friendly for towards ASIC, but they actually both support are the same architecture. So basically, you can encode a path into either a list of 128 bit segments in an extension header of IPv6, of just another IP header if you only want to have one instruction, and only one other IP header if you want to have multiple small instructions. That's the compressed SID version. So you're gonna tell me what the heck does it do with applications. So basically, you do your instructions. Instructions are packet processing programs. Every one to do when you treat a packet can be done in P4, can it be done in C, can it be done in eBPF, for example, and it's all you do what instructions you want your packet to be processed on. And you implement them at multiple points. As I said before, they are locally dependent. So I can actually create a code that nobody in the world will ever know what it does, but it's my code and actually it's, it's customized to me. 
They can be standardized, so some of those instructions are standard, how to do encapsulation of layer two, how to decap and do a lookup in, v in IP table v4, those kind of things. And some can be totally user-defined. So for example, a network function vendor would want to create something which is SRV6 compliant, could decide I, re I do a complete instruction code into my box and my function, and it, still will, it would still be SRV6 compliant even though I have not gone to the ITF and standardized it. So to my logic, and if I do the summarization of SR segment routing v6, I call it the one protocol to rule them all. Because once you've done it well, you don't have to go back to any standards to build, rebuild and be a, a, have acknowledgement. It's all integrated. Uh, once you've done this, once you have created all your, se your, your, your segments, then you create your SR policy or your end-to-end -end program. And then you steer traffic based on any kind of characteristics you want to do, either logical, physical interfaces, or five tuples and all those things, and the, actually how you will build, you will build your network, your, you build your, your, your network program. So what is interesting is from a single logic of a policy of a single address bit, I can represent any networking constructs. Layer two, layer three, functionalized, firewall, everything can be uh, identified this way. So that brings me back to the dreaded telco networking use case. This is how we actually have to deal with networking right now in a Kubernetes world. Most of our applications need to talk to multiple domains. We don't know how to do it easily in, in, in uh, Kubernetes. We create an insane amount of complexity with Maltus, multi-CNI, try to do those kind of hooks. We still haven't figured out how to connect my Kubernetes cluster to multiple environments. And the reality is uh, network uh, operators, even enterprises, have that problem. Um, and, so, and before that, we didn't really think about this, but I think it became into a spotlight when telco started to think about using Kubernetes, which was the first thing that happened. Uh, but so what I'm trying to look at, and when we look, when we engage with the EasyLMN team, is how could we do something a bit more disruptive and looking at new ways of addressing the problem. This is where we went and did SRV6 VPN, or Layer 3 VPN, into Cilium. How to leverage the construct of Cilium and the policies, egress policies, to be able to be able to have a pod, single interface, single default routing table, nothing complex, no forwarding rules, no uh, insanities of IP static routes, to be able to attach the right, uh, the right networking constructs when required, and use the logic of BGP VPN v4 for, for, uh, for the uh, layer 3 VPN advertisement to be able to create those policies dynamically. So from a developer perspective, you just assign a VRF, the rest becomes really quite simple. Once you've done this, any pattern is now possible because I found a way to hook my network, my, my application into a network. My network can be stretched across multiple domains, multiple technologies, because I can still use the other constructs of the network with like gateways and NAT devices, whatever we want. We can also introduce service chains. We can actually insert functions or different devices, either physical or virtual, inside that policy, meaning my cluster can now, re uh, my, my program can now reach beyond the Kubernetes cluster and be able to attach to, uh, uh, to the network or to have the services. So in essence, I'm making my network more programmable by combining the strengths, the strengths of, EPF, of eBPF and SRV6. How do I do it? You build a simple instruction using eVPF code, whether it's in encapsulation, decapsulation, any kind of packet processing engine. You link those segments to, a, to those instructions to a SRV6 segment ID. Basically, you give them an IPv6 address. Uh, you build the policies out, those, out of those IPv6 addresses, those segments, which creates a segment list. And then you find a way to steer the traffic in any way or form into that policy. And behold, you now have a network program. Simple encapsulation, supporting overlay, underlay, and be able to do ser complex service chaining, which in, the, in, in Realm, I can actually have an application doing network functions at the application level, still being able to be tied to a program which is also supports my underlay traffic engineering. For example, network slicing, if you look about the 5G transport, all, of that, all those kind of things, including service chaining in a simple, simple way using the, the, the SRV6 protocol and the flexibility Cilium and ABPF give me. That's basically the crash course of why we went at that approach to support our networking requirements. I will pass the mic to, uh, to um, Luis. We can explain the details of how it's been implemented. 
Hey everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Lewis. I'm a staff software engineer at um, Isovalent. And for this part of the talk, I'm going to go in uh, into detail on how we achieved the POC of a popular SRV6 feature, L3 VPN, which was uh, somewhat explained already. So the first concept that we needed to achieve was pod VRF membership. Uh, the idea here, and one of our design goals, was for a pod to belong to multiple VRFs. And uh, to achieve this, we would like the Cilium data path to identify the destination traffic of its egress traffic, destination of its egress traffic. Um, and depending on that destination, it'll identify which VRF um, should that traffic be tagged as. In order to do that, uh, like most things with eBPF, uh, we accomplish this with a series of maps which store state. So I'm actually going to explain these maps from bottom up here. Um, the first map that we have is the VRF map. And this takes the pod's IP address and the destination cider and maps it to a VRF ID. So this gives us the notion of VRF, uh, pod VRF membership. Next, we have a SID map, which is a simple mapping between SRV6 uh, SIDs and the VRFs, um, uh, th which the SIDs act as locators for. And finally, we have a policy map. Uh, the policy map takes the destination CIDR and the VRF, which we've identified the traffic belonging to, and then provides you a SID. Uh, this really allows us to encode multiple SIDs for a particular VRF. Okay, so what does that actually look like um, on the data path side? The next, um, the next concept that we have to uh, achieve is traffic encapsulation, right? So the idea here is that you label a pod, um, and that pod, that label, uh, determines the VRFs that uh, the pod could potentially be in. When the pod begins egressing traffic, the Cilium data path will identify which VRF um, it would belong to, and then it performs a policy lookup um, inside the policy map, which I just covered, to identify which SID should actually encap um, the outgoing traffic. So at the actual data path level, what are we doing? Um, so here I have a packet flow diagram, and I'm going to start at the top left. When a pod sends traffic, we traverse the egress, uh, the VETH device, and we hit the host networking stack. From there, we'll do a fib lookup, and we'll find the native device. On the native device, we attach a TC egress eBPF program. If you're not super familiar with the terms TC egress or uh, TC ingresses, they're more or less cues which you can hook eBPF programs onto as the packet traverses either direction of the interface. So let me go through the actual logic flow of what happens when SRV SRV6 traffic is egressing. We'll perform um, a lookup into the IP cache map. So I didn't cover this map much, but it's a uh, mapping of IP addresses that Cilium knows about. Um, it gives us metadata. For instance, it will tell us that the uh, destination address, is it a IP address in our cluster or not? If it's not in our cluster, um, then we're going to actually go the incap path. Um, from there, the uh, traffic will do a VRF lookup on the traffic. We'll take the source IP address and the destination address, and then look up the VRF ID. Again, we'll take the VRF ID, and then we'll do a destination uh, along with the destination address and do a lookup in the policy map. The policy map will provide us the SID, it will incap the traffic, and then the um, SRV6 becomes the outer packet. The SRV6 SID becomes the outer packet, and then the inner packet is the original pod traffic. So now the next step we'd have to deal with is traffic decapsulation. So in this uh, packet flow diagram, we first have a native device, ETH0, and incoming uh, to the Cilium data path, we see that there is a SID. Uh, when the Cilium data path determines that this could be a SID, we're going to do a lookup in the SID map and determine if uh, we know about this. Did, did we find this from the control plane? Did we allocate it ourselves? If we did, we decap the packet. So again, what does that look like on the data path? 
Here we have the ETH device hanging off uh, external network, and packet is now ingressing. Packets are ingressing now. We again attach a eBPF program on the TC ingress this side, and we perform a SID lookup uh, with the SID map. And then if it is a destination SID we know, we decap it, and then we send um, the packet, uh, the inner packet, to Rx. That might be more data pack processing. Normally, that just goes to the pod. So um, L3 VPN usually also includes a BGP aspect. Um, and in this case, uh, Cilium can act as a BGP speaker. And it can actually learn about upstream PE uh, VPN networks this way. So when Cilium is acting as a BGP speaker, we have a concept called the BGP control plane, and it can peer with upstream PEs. And the um, advertisements, uh, VPN v4, BGP advertisements, hold the data which tr um, provide the VPN information, the SID, the prefix. Um, and when we learn about this, we go ahead and we map those VPN v4 advertisements into data path map calls, which programs the maps which we outlined before and sets up the encapsulation um, side. Likewise, uh, for the decapsulation side, again, using our BGP control plane, we're able to understand a VRF has been created and we can allocate a SID for this VRF and then we can advertise that forward to um, upstream PEs. Uh, when they learn about it, they'll understand that um, they can encapsulate traffic in a particular SID, send it to us, we'll decap it, and then send it off to a pod. Okay, so with that, we actually have a demo of the POC. And uh, the end show. So there should be audio involved with this. Yeah. Nothing? Okay, well, I'll just talk us through it then the best I can. So we have a topology here, and um, let's describe it uh, starting on the right side. We have uh, Cilium acting as a PE, and we have um, pod one, which is in VRF zero. Cilium is uh, peered with PE0, and it's going to advertise L3 VPN routes uh, for the VRF0. PE0 is an FRR router, and um, it has two routers hanging off it, uh, CE1 and CE2, and they both have overlapping VPN uh, addresses. So the idea here is that pod one can send traffic, it can be encapsulated, and reach uh, VPN 10.3.0.1.24 over VRF zero. So let me speed ahead a little bit. Okay, so we're taking an initial look here at uh, FRR, and this explains the FRR configuration that we have. Um, this is PE zero, so this is explaining um, that the routing table of FRR has two NDT4 routes. These NDT4 routes uh, tell FRR that when it sees those SIDs, uh, we're interested in the VRF zero routing table here, uh, the uh, uh, routing entry there, and the SID of the B200100. When it sees that SID ingress, it's going to decapsulate it and send it off to VRF zero. That's our initial FRR configuration. So what we don't have right now is the encapsulation portion, which says the return traffic going towards FRR needs to be encapsulated in a SID which locates pod one's VRF zero on Cilium side. So we apply a configuration and then we trigger this. Um, what, th what this is doing um, is having Cilium uh, allocate a SID, 
and uh, sent, uh, making an advertisement up to FRR saying, to get to VRF0, you can encapsulate this traffic in this SID that we've allocated. Here's a log line showing us that we've done the actual um, SID allocation, which is highlighted there. And then the resulting routing table 100 um, on FRR indicates that we have learned about the allocated SID and that when we see uh, egressing traffic to 10, 1, 0, 0, slash 24, we're going to encapsulate it in the SID which Cilium allocated and sent forward over the BGP control plane. The 10, 1, 0, 0, slash 24, that's our pod cider. So that's going to get the traffic back. Okay, so here we start a ping from pod one in VRF zero. This is a good sign because the traffic's already coming back. Uh, so we know we have end-to-end -end communication. Uh, but now we probably want to dig a little bit deeper and show a TCP dump of what's actually going on on the wire itself. And, okay, so now we have an echo request and an echo reply. Uh, what we can see here is the outer IP address of the request. You see our allocated SID, um, and you see that the destination is the VRF0 on FRR side, the SID which locates that. You can see that it is an encapsulated packet, and the um, inner IPs are our pod, our pod IP address, 101097, and the destination is VRF zeros, 10301. Likewise, um, the return traffic is now coming from our host, uh, our FRR node at B1 uh, one colon colon one, and it's destined to our um, SRV6 SID on the Cilium side. So ideally what happens is that when Cilium sees this SID, it's going, its data path is going to be set up in such a way that it will decap that SID pull out the inner uh, IP address of 101097 and deliver that forward uh, to pod one. And that is currently occurring because you see the pod, you see the um, return traffic getting back to pod one. Demonstrated there. And then the last interesting thing to note is just looking at CE1s, right? So CE1 is all the, all the way on the other side of the um, customer's network. It's past the PEs and it's over uh, hanging off um, FRR's VRF zero interface. What we see here is the encapsulated traffic, right? So this is just a, uh, a proof saying, okay, yeah, we did the decapsulation. Um, we don't see any IPv6 addresses. Uh, we basically have end-to-end -end, uh, L3 VPN as a proof of concept working. So yeah. Um, that's all for the demo, and then, um, yeah, I'm pretty much good. There was the, yeah. You expelled it, please. Yep, and just, I am uh, far from the only person working on uh, this. It's uh, been a lot of fun, and it's definitely uh, some cool network tech that uh, I got the um, liberty to working with. Uh, two other great engineers, Paul and Utaro and Jerome, three other great engineers. <laughs> great. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Do you have questions? I'll come to you. Go, oh, coming around. Hi, so you have two amazing and awesome policy expression languages, and um, I'm curious for the SRV6 side, if you think about end-to-end -end observability, about what's happening between eBPF and SRV6, is Hubble taking 
SRv6 data, or do you sort of do debugging between eBPF and SRv6 if you're trying to figure out end-to-end -end or what was the state of a route at one point, or if which labels were used, or which v6 addresses were used for what at one point? Like, how do you think about that end-to-end -end operability debugging? Yes, yeah, so currently, I don't think uh, there is a integration with this POC and Hubble currently. Um, but the traffic flow would follow the normal data path flow. So given uh, that we can see the traffic and pull out um, labeled information, then we do have the control plane, which has all the smarts of what's going on, right? So we should be able to pick apart that information and be intelligent about how we show the traffic uh, observation. And there'd be some storage of what that was at 10 p.m. yesterday versus the network view of that. Pull, or, pull down your mask a bit, yeah. Right, you know, so so going a few days before, not just the real time, you know, thinking about that, but how you would look at what the state was a few days ago if you're trying to debug a ticket or some question about connectivity, you know, something that might not have been working but didn't wasn't detected in real time. Yeah. So um, you, you, you will add the, the information out of Hubble for the data path, the routing plane, you can actually get the stream telemetry or the stream data of how the BGP routes, you can get time stamping on how you, your state of your route were. I think it's not part of Hubble, but the correlation can be done quite, uh, quite easily. Any other questions? Thank you very much.